Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to give folks just an additional few moments to uh, connect to their audio, and then we will get going. All right, and with that, I think we're ready to go. Again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the NSBA Veterans Network's uh, third installment of the Service to Success series. Uh, today's discussion, uh, Accelerated Pathways in Defense Acquisition, Getting on Contract Quicker, Faster, and Better, uh, will be um, an intermediate to advanced level discussion of uh, how to excel in, in defense and federal procurement. Um, and joining us today, we have a really fantastic cast of leaders in the space uh, who've got some great insights to share with you. Uh, now, before we get going, I would just like to hit a couple of administrative items with y'all. Uh, the first being that, if possible, we would appreciate it if you could keep uh, the chat feature of this Zoom room open uh, um, and not add anything there except your questions. Uh, during our, our Q&A portion of the event today, we will be taking questions exclusively from the chat, uh, just so we can facilitate properly and make sure we get folks' questions in the order in which they're received. Uh, so again, please keep the chat free of, of all items except for your questions. And then secondly, if folks could stay on mute throughout the discussion, uh, that'll help us um, make sure that we can hear our speakers and get as many insights as we can in the time that we have together. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to NSBA trustee and uh, leader of the NSBA Veterans Network, Joni Myers. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well and um, looking forward to a uh, upcoming Thanksgiving week. So as we get started, I am uh, very honored, first of all, to serve as a trustee for NSBA. And I'm joined today with Bill Belknap, who's also a trustee of NSBA. But our special guest today, are Graham Plaster, who's director of Nautilus, part of the Defense Network, Defense Works Network, and also the founder of the Intelligence Community Inc. And then Ben Stinson, who is founder of um, the fe, fe, excuse me, excuse me, let's try that again. Ben Stinson, who is founder of Fed Sherpas. Both gentlemen are, um, uh, Ben is a former uh, Marine Corps officer and Graham is a, I believe still reserved Marine or a Navy officer. And so we're going to uh, get started here today by letting um, each gentleman tell a little bit about their, kind of fill out their biography and a little bit about their journey to how they got to where they are today. So Graham, would you like to get started? Sure, yeah, it's an honor to talk to you all today. Uh, my background is um, I was at the Naval Academy uh, and graduated um, right after 9-11. So 9-11 happened during my senior year there. Uh, you can read about that if you look up a book called In the Shadow of Greatness, which was uh, kind of a collection of stories from our class. I helped edit that, and that was on the Navy's official reading list. So you can find that. But after I graduated from the Naval Academy, I was on a ship out of Hawaii, went to the Arabian Gulf, was in Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, and then went from there to the Naval War College, where I was the assistant dean of students for a few years, and then went into the foreign area officer program. If you're familiar with FAOs, I learned a little bit of Arabic, and then I did a joint tour with the Army doing uh, UN peacekeeping operations, saw the wind down in Iraq over uh, those three years. And, uh, and then I got out in 2013 and started a company called the Intelligence Community Inc., which is a social network for national security. And that's still going. Uh, but while I was doing that, I was moonlighting at the Pentagon as a policy advisor at OSD for six years and then went to do some work for Alaska Native Corporation, um, was an advisor for a couple AI companies. And then two years ago, I came on as the director of Nautilus which is a public-private partnership between Defense Works, which is a 501c3 in Florida, and uh, Naval X, which is the Navy's new innovation organization. So I'll just pause there. Okay, Ben, you wanna pick it up? Hi, thank you. I appreciate it, Joni and uh, Ian. Thank you so much for having us on here. Um, my journey was uh, a little bit uh, similar 
uh, joined the Marine Corps in uh, 1991. Uh, was air traffic control in the beginning, then became air command and control, and uh, got to go to the Naval Postgraduate School, learned something about this uh, defense systems acquisition, uh, all about how the Defense Department buys uh, and develops weapon systems. So uh, payback tour at Marine Corps Systems Command, uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter got assessed into the Marine Corps Acquisition Corps, professionalized core of civilians and uniformed officers who uh, manage the programs. <clears throat> and I had the, the great fortune of working with several uh, really new technologies at the time, uh, started a UAV program at NAVAIR, <clears throat> worked on a lot of tactical command and control equipment, which uh, for those of you who wouldn't understand maybe what that's like, uh, some of it's TCP IP based, some of it's not TCP IP based, but it's network communications gear uh, that uh, allows the military to do what's called command and control. Uh, I also had the good fortune of working for the Army as a Marine Corps officer up in Warren, Michigan, as the Joint Program Manager of Robotics. Uh, I led a test and evaluation command uh, that also did engineering and operational forces support. My last job in the Marine Corps was the Enterprise IT uh, Developer Procurement Testing Agent at Marine Corps Systems Command, so the, the buyer of IT equipment for the enterprise. That set me up for, uh, as I retired in 2019, to go work for a, a small company and uh, learn the ropes um, of, uh, of being on the other side of the, of the uh, table, if you will, of the agreement table, working for industry uh, and became a CIO for that company and also helped them with the digital line of business. Um, did that for about three years and then uh, got the entrepreneurial bug, like a lot of veterans do, a lot of, a lot of you out there and started my own company, consulting company, Fed Sherpas. And what I'm able to do there is to take my 20 plus years of program management experience, technology advisory experience, uh, and uh, understanding how things work. So that translates to what's called business development in the, in the business world and, and offer that sort of as a service to other companies uh, from uh, ranging from startups to small companies, mid-levels, uh, 501c3s actually do business with the government and they need help too, um, all the way up to, uh, you know, the very largest defense companies who value experience of people helping them uh, make better proposals and increase their, their chance of winning a contract. So that's what brought me here. Uh, I joined uh, the uh, NSBA uh, this, just this year and uh, want to be able to help other veterans and help other small businesses, especially in this area of doing business with the government. Thank you, Joey. Thanks, Ben. Well, as we get started today, um, I'd just like to kind of shape the environment, if you will. Um, I'd like to maybe start out with a, just a couple numbers. Um, from 2009 to 2021, the number of small businesses receiving government contracts, so that's across all of the U.S. government, fell dramatically. So from 2009, 121,181 small businesses received government contracts. But then in 2021, 65,455, I'm sorry, in 2022, 65,455. So clearly we've seen that number in just a little over 10 years cut in half. So small business is having a hard time in doing business with the government. And just between 2021 and 2022, we saw a 4% drop in small businesses as primes. So we are really up against a really decreasing numbers. And the reasons why are many. The government contracting is complex. And so what we really wanted to do today is dig into our discussion with these um, really three wonderfully experienced gentlemen to see what are some of the quicker, faster, better paths to quickly get on contract. And so we're going to start, um, Graham, I'm, I'm going to kind of queue up a, here a question for you. So when you, we talk a lot about PIAs, and maybe you could explain that acronym to our audience, but um, very few people really know what they are. So can you help illuminate what is a PIA and, 
you know, kind of give us an idea why that might be a good pathway for our audience today. Sure, yeah. PS stands for uh, Partnership Intermediary Agreement. It's covered under Titles 10 and 15 of the Congressional Code. And they're really designed to help uh, like a federal lab to run faster, jump higher, um, and it's just an accelerant for the current federal program. And generally speaking, a PIA might have some state and local organizations funding it. So you might have like the state of Montana has a PIA or a university system uh, pulls together resources and puts together a PIA. And in common parlance, that's a public-private partnership. So you're looking at ways that you can help the government to, to reach beyond its natural bureaucratic you know, extent. And, and you, you can see great benefits to this in, you know, faith-based initiatives. Um, and you can obviously see great benefits to it with academic partnerships. If you look at the cone of government contracting on Defense Acquisition University's website, you'll see that there's a lot of different tools in the tool belt of acquisition. And uh, PIA is just one small slice of that. And it's on the non-FAR side. So you have a lot of FAR-based activities you can do, and then you have a few things you can do that are non-FAR, and a PIA is just one small piece of that. And we would like to work you know, hand in glove with the other pieces that you can do. So a PIA is designed for the government to go out and really kind of light a pilot light under a new idea and say, hey, what are the emerging technology companies that exist that we don't know about? And the PIA can go out and find those companies, bring them into the conversation, and because we're a nonprofit, we're we're a neutral middleman, and we don't take any fees from the companies. We don't take any equity, and uh, and then we get the conversation started. But then we can hand it off to a program record contract or an 8A contract or anything the government wants to do from there. So, Graham, in your experience, is that a faster pathway to help a small business get on contract? It can be a lot faster. So, the PIA process itself that DefenseWorks runs is usually a 45 to 90 day sprint. Okay. Um, and in the in the, that process, um, traditionally, what we do is a what we call B to B or a business to business transaction. So once the government gives money to the nonprofit, we can turn around and hire that company out of one of our events to create a, a working prototype or a demo or something like that that the government can then look at, and then they can say, okay, we want to do a little bit more of that and feasibility or whatever. And so, so that process can take a, maybe a, between a month to three years, depending on what the government wants. And then from there, they can bridge into a, uh, a program record contract or something else. But yeah, we can move very quickly as a PO. That's wonderful. Well, I love the word sprint. That's uh, not quite uh, the norm in government contracting. So Ben, you have a lot of experiences, what are known as OTAs, and uh, maybe you could uh, kind of illuminate, uh, kind of sh share what the acronym stands for, and also your experience. What makes it different from some of the standard acquisition process that many of us would be more familiar with? Yes, thank you. So OTAs um, are not a, a new phenomenon in the federal government. Their use is what's very new. So the first uh, OTA uh, NASA had back in 1958, uh, if you can imagine that, you know, sometimes what's old is new again, right? We go through these phases. And uh, it wasn't until 1996 that DOD actually used that authority that NASA created or was created for NASA and extrapolated or expanded it or, or basically adopted it to use for DARPA. Uh, and then ever since 1996, what we have seen for OTAs, other transaction authorities, also non-FAR based contracts, um, is that they have increased in terms of their use. They have spread to 11 other agencies. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so, so because they're in 11 agencies, they are in a lot of different sections of U.S. code. Uh, for the DOD, they usually when you see a change or an expansion of an OTA, uh, use policy or an allowance, if you will, you'll see that in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. And then after a few years, once it's in the National Defense Authorization Act, if lawmakers want it, want to keep it, it gets put into U.S. code. So uh, a other transaction authority has all of the legal elements of a contract. So, but they don't call it contract. It's not FAR-based. 
it's not DFAR based. So those of you who do uh, defense business, you know that there's a special FAR just for defense. And then the, the FAR is the basic federal acquisition uh, regulation or the, the, the standard one that applies across all. So OTAs will generally not have a lot of FAR, won't have anything FAR based in them unless a FAR clause is included and they can be. So you do need to check for that if you are trying to go after an OTA. Uh, one example would be if you're doing an OTA that comes out through the Department of Defense, there is a DFARS clause in there that does include the NIST 800-171 standard, which is that cybersecurity standard because they're very serious about it. So when they want to, they will grab some DFARS clauses and put that in your contract. In terms of the timeline for an OTA, uh, many OTAs will bill uh, the, the timeline being 90 days, right? Um, that's sort of aspirational <laughs> in most cases. Uh, what I see most OTAs doing is they'll have a period of time where both the government and industry will discuss uh, an idea. Uh, some, some consortiums, we'll get into that in a second, some consortiums call that pre-solicitation. Um, and it would be a, equivalent to a source of sought, maybe on the DFAR side or the FAR side where you get to discuss it with them. They're, you're, they're still shaping their ideas about what they even want. Uh, and then they will go into either white papers, enhanced white papers, or this thing called an RPP, a request for a prototype. Um, what you want for businesses, what you want in an OTA is an OTA that is competitively awarded because that means they can do follow-on contracts with you uh, without having to recompete it. This would be the equivalent of doing the R&D effort and then on a D, on the far side, them also putting the competition out for the production, right? <clears throat> you want as a company to have your R&D become production. And so that's why you want to look for OTAs that pre-compete it. Um, consortiums usually run OTAs. Consortiums are, like we heard Graham talk about, 501c3s. Uh, that keeps the uh, organizational conflict of interest piece, uh, you know, in the right spot. They won't compete for contracts. They just basically administer them for the government. Um, they they generally have a timeline. Uh, I would say most of them, on average, takes about 120 days to to get awarded. Um, they range in fee from zero to join the consortium up to, I think some of the more expensive ones I've heard of have been several thousands of dollars a year. Most of them run in the $500 a year range for you to join, especially if you're a small, a small business. So, um, and then, and then there's a, uh, on the award, there will be some sort of a pass-through fee. It's usually no more than 1% that would then go to the consortium to, you know, pay back what it's doing in terms of its uh, management. And, and so you need to be able to negotiate with that. Um, so one key difference with between FAR-based and OTA-based is you can discuss with the government that solicitation up until the day that the RPP or the proposal period closes. You can't do that under a DFARS contract. Once the RFP is active and live, you are under the cone of silence and you can't talk to them. Here, they encourage discussion until the stop date of, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, proposal so that they can start going into their evaluation period. Uh, I'll pause there and, and we'll uh, kick it back over to Johnny. Wanderful information. So Bill, I wanna turn to you. Um, I know I've always marveled at your background and experience as well. So you've, um, both as an army officer, your time in the Pentagon, um, the innovation side of the DOD, and then also um, working with uh, very large uh, contractors and then um, as a founder of your own company. So from that kind of realm of experience, kind of listening to some of the pathways that Graham has suggested and um, Ben as well, what do you think are the real highlights? What are the points that you'd like to emphasize for our audience? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Jody. I appreciate it. So um, my background real quick is uh, 20 years uh, retired Army. Uh, first 10 years was with uh, tank combat troops, platoon leader, uh, company command, etc. cetera. Uh, then after that, I went into the Abrams Tank Program Office and helped uh, to take the uh, M1A1, which is the analog version of the uh, Abrams Tank, to digital, which was the M1A2. 
So we went through the various milestones procedures uh, um, to, to implement uh, a full-scale production, which was a milestone three uh, for that program. Before that, I was a contracting officer. So I had uh, the various uh, contracting officer uh, classes and training uh, to get my warrant. Um, and my warrant was for uh, construction projects. Uh, after that, I was with a large corporation for 10 years where I was a site general manager. So I've got some civilian corporate experience uh, managing numerous vendors, um, for Pfizer, a large, large, of course, a large company. Uh, and then I started my own company uh, 12 years ago. So my company right now, uh, we deal, uh, we've been awarded over 190 contracts, uh, federal government con or uh, government contracts of that mostly are federal and of the federal mostly are with the Veterans Affairs, um, um, uh, Veterans Affairs Administration. So, uh, and, and we do work at the VA medical centers. Most of that work that we're doing right now is a firm fixed price and also best value contracts. So it's a construction, mechanical, electrical, plumbing type type projects. I will say that uh, based on the, the the topic that we've dis discussed here, uh, I greatly uh, admire Graham and, and, and Ben's background uh, and their detailed uh, technical uh, analysis and, and, and viewpoints of uh, you know PIA and also other transaction authority. Um, when I was with the uh, tank program office, we certainly used some of the uh, other transaction authority to incorporate uh, um, uh, the latest research or latest uh, technology into the Abrams tank um, before it was fielded. Certainly many parts of the tank are um, top secret, uh, no, no surprise there. And so we had to use uh, other transactional authority. Um, and then as far as the uh, partnership intermediary uh, agreement uh, type of um, contract awards, um, I, I think that... Uh, you know, that reminds me of the SBIR type of projects where um, certainly you can gather information from universities and can, that can be a quite prolific way to go uh, toward uh, taking that, uh, um, that that information that universities develop um, and uh, commercializing it and also offering it to the federal government. Um, so I, I greatly admire that 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 avenue. You know, as, a, as a practical matter, here's some advice that I would give. Number one, you know, we have an enormity of individuals on this call, which is awesome. Certainly there's a varying degrees of experience with government contracting. Some uh, are, pro, are professionals at it, which I greatly admire. Some are just starting um, and, and getting their feet on the ground. How do I, I wanna get involved. I wanna be a government contractor. How do I do it? And I would just say that one of the key things I would suggest is you get training and you can get free training with the Small Business Administration. You know, the regional office has uh, beginning courses in government contracting and also advanced courses in government contracting. And, you know, with, with all the numerous um, contract awards that I mentioned, I mentioned about 190 contract awards in the government. But I'll tell you, with a win rate of one out of four, that also tell you how many we've lost and uh, gather lessons learned from that. So that would be the second component I would tell you. Um, if you're hesitant about, you know, pursuing it, you, know, you got to take the you got to take the leap and you got to take action. And one of the greatest things about uh, submitting a proposal, you want to make sure you dot your T. Uh, 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 dot your I's and cross your T's uh, with what it says for the proposal requirements. You have to be absolute on that. And given that you do that, you know, um, you submit your proposal. What I always say is uh, um, government contract awards is with taxpayers money. And you as a taxpayer are taking your time and attention and resources to submit your proposal. And one way, shape or form, the government owes you some feedback on, on that, on how you're doing or what you could do to be better. And let me tell you something, professional athletes, et cetera, they don't just to get be at the top of their game. They keep practicing over and over again, and they get lessons learned, and they incorporate that into their future proposals. And that's a, that's a, that's a um, high uh, probability of success way uh, to win and get government contracts by submitting your proposals, making sure they're, they're, uh, uh, they're uh, compliant, and getting feedback if you don't win. Um, uh, and then incorporating that into future proposals. That's wonderful. So uh, thank you very much. I think that that perspective is um, really, really key. Um, and, and maybe Graham, we can kind of continue along those lines in the sense that um, I'd like you to speak a little bit about the two hats you wear, because uh, just uh, the, talk about Nautilus in a little bit more detail and some maybe engagement points for our audience potentially. And then also, I think um, something I participate with you on in the intelligence network, but uh, you are probably to me, 
one of the most masterful uh, people in connecting and um, the relationship side of business, if you will. And uh, Bill touched on like after actions, which um, I help support the special operations community. And I think uh, after actions is uh, a uh, hourly, a daily, and uh, uh, you know, literally built into all of aspects of um, you know th their uh, performance. So speak to us a little bit from the different hats and and you know, kind of why relationships are important. Why some of these um, non-traditional pathways, you know, may, might be force multipliers. Yeah, a lot of people might be familiar with uh, General McChrystal's book, Team of Teams. You know, coming out of 9-11 and, and during the war on terror, there was a, there was an imperative to try to figure out how to get all the different groups working together. And there was a big tent philosophy of, you know, when people were downrange, trying to figure out how to get everybody under the tent, talking to each other at the right times, sharing the right information. And other people might be familiar with the 9-11 Commission report, which really had a scathing review of the intelligence community that said that um, if we'd only been sharing the, the appropriate information at the right times with the right people, then we probably could have prevented 9-11. Um, and so kind of with that framework, when I was active duty, I got a master's degree and I focused on social networks in Iran. This was at the very beginning of Facebook and LinkedIn and everything. And and uh, so when I got out of uh, uniform, I created a social network for the intelligence community because one of the things I saw happening was that the, the imperatives of the 9-11 Commission report weren't being met by the current technologies that were designed for crowdsourcing and, and socializing. Uh, and myself as a digital native, I just wanted to provide that with some top cover from somebody who'd been there. Uh, so I, I built a social network called the intelligence community, offered it to the intelligence community as a resource. We had a contract with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency with IBM and Amazon for a little while and did some things. But from there, I just developed a philosophy, which is that virtual worlds need virtuous leaders. And this this means that you know you can go on any social networking platform and find people that are objectifying each other and being cruel. Um, and so what we need to do, especially as veterans and as Americans, we need to step into those places and create uh, positive environments. And that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And so I launched at the beginning of COVID, a newsletter called Silicon Nation, which is really just designed around national security technology um, in an entrepreneurship and investing. And so we've been meeting every Monday night for an hour and discussing different topics. Joni's a regular on there. Um, and out of that network, um, I think that that made me a good fit for uh, Nautilus because Defense Works as a PIA um, organization really wants to build these types of big tent organizations. They want to build an ecosystem. They want to have a team of teams. So that, that's why I am here where I am. And no matter where I go, I always try to bring people together. That's wonderful. Um... Ben, tell me, let's let's dig down a little bit further on OTAs. Um, maybe kind of highlight some trends, where the spending's going. Um, I'm certain we all are very familiar in the in that rather frustrating environment with uh, uh, CRs. Can, it looks like now continuing, um, at least for the government's not shutting down this week. Um, but, but maybe share some data points on, you know, kind of, where you see the um, the puck going, if you will, or you know, kind of current to to what you see in in the next you know several months, um, you know, in kind of view out. Uh, so I'll cover it uh, sort of a macro trend piece, and then I'll talk specifically about what would be FY twenty four that we've entered for the for the uh, federal government. So on a macro scale, uh, OTA spending continues to increase since they started keeping records. Of, uh, the records I found were back to about 2016, where it was $1.7 billion. Uh, that reached a high water mark of spending in the federal government. This is a GAO report. I found this from federal government uh, was spending close to $18 billion in 2020 uh, on OTAs. That was driven a lot by COVID because uh, the health agencies as well as DOD turned to the OTA 
to go very quickly to get some folks on contract to not just find a cure, so to speak, or, you know, find, you know, for the vaccines, that was a large part because a lot of money was dropped on that, but all sorts of other COVID related, how do we cleanse places? How do we, you know, do other things that were those secondary effects that, that came out of COVID? So since that time in the last two years, it's dropped back down uh, closer to about $12 billion per year. Um, I think that's going to uh, normalize for a bit. And then I think either there are going to be other non-FAR based contracting uh, agreements, if you will, uh, let's just call them agreements, other non-FAR based agreements or contracts that will compete with OTAs, or I think OTAs will ramp up again. Um, so uh, let's talk about OTAs for 2024. Um, what I uh, witnessed uh, as a program manager during CRs, during government shutdowns, was your schedule is perturbated. You have a plan for using the money and, and you can't submit a plan up to the, the budgeting chain that includes CRs or delays in budgets or anything like that. You can't have your first you know, three months of the year off, so to speak, of not awarding money. They'll ask you, well, why? Well, because I'm planning there'll be CR. No, you can't do that. So you, you lay your money in for the quarters like you have all the quarters and the money's gonna be there one October. That's what you have to do. But what we have found in the last 10, 15 years is that these CRs, especially around election years, get very uh, uh, popular politically to, to hold off and use as negotiating tools. All that does is for every part of the government, it shortens their buying window, okay? And so what is a program manager to do? Well, what I and many other program managers did was look for places either to park my money or existing contracts, right? Because that contract is already let. And if the scope is what I wanted to do, I'd go to that contract. But if I'm trying to do something relatively new and on a small scale, I would look for things like OTAs because they do have, even if they're not running at 90 days, even if they're running at 120 days, that is nothing like the average contract, which could take, you know, uh, you're measuring that not in days, you're measuring that in months if not even years or portions of years to go from start to finish on, on the complete, you know, getting the requirement, put, putting out source selection uh, or solicitation uh, sources sought, and then actually making an award. That, that no contracting office that I'm aware of under a FAR based can do that in 90 days. The only thing that even gets close is uh, lowest price technically acceptable. And that's just, you award the first person on the list that meets what it is for the price you're willing to pay. And you go to them, you stop you stop your source selection at that point. So uh, I, I foresee at the end of, or the middle of 2024, because your money can't go to the, you have to have your money lined up for something or it's gonna get taken. So I think you're going to see a lot more OTA actions, especially for people who want to buy prototypes at the LRIP quantity. Uh, LRIP is a, is a term that we use. That's it's how you start up your production lines. You get uh, representative articles for testing and for other uses. And so uh, I see people using OTAs to get that quantity bought, a small amount of quantity, because it'll be easier to go through than trying to buy the whole production amount off that, off that type of a vehicle. Okay, excellent. So Bill, we've heard some, um, I think some really good uh, comments here to, to talk about um, kind of where we're going, what uh, some successes, um, some different pathways. Um, one of the things you and I have talked about is, you know, kind of what we really think has been our secret sauce or where we've been successful, you know, and for me, um, I hunt disruptive, I scout disruptive technologies. And as um, technically engaging that is, the my secret sauce is the relationships, and you know, working through the veteran community, working, um, sharing information with my peers, joining different groups, and um, also really trying to get in or in front of or be around the you know the government community in the right places if you will um to to learn more and you know have a user perspective so i understand how to best propose or um you know meet a requirement so 
what's tell me what your secret sauce and in, in tremendously successful business and uh highly complex but what's the bottle of secret sauce <laughs> sure so uh, a couple of thoughts one is um um you know, uh, to get into uh, government contracting if, in your specific uh, area of expertise, um, it is helpful to start smaller um, to because uh, get, award, getting awarded a smaller project will help build that relationship. And, um, you know, if you go after a, uh, as, as uh, I think Ben mentioned, Lipta, lowest price technically acceptable, which is just playing really low bid. And in my experience, technically acceptable is a relatively low bar. Uh, to achieve, you know, if you have some modicum of of, of experience uh, with that, but um, given that um, you're you're uh, you have some modicum of experience or uh, ability to perform that contract, um, and you're the low bid, the government has to award you that contract. So think about that. That's a great way to get in uh, in into wh whatever uh, area that you that you're interested in. Um, I guess the second thing is, uh, you know, relationships, you know, whether you're in, in commercial uh, industry or, or government industry, relations matter. Um, and it does take time. You know, marketing, uh, typically the uh, uh, the uh, uh, one of the essence of marketing is that you have to show a commercial seven times before it, it hits home with, you know, with being effective or starting to be effective and, and recognized. And I, I would I would suggest to you that's the similar with government contracting. It takes a while to develop a relationship, you know, with a contracting officer or program manager. And it's simply a matter, you know, it's a matter of uh, in, in some way, shape or form getting to know the, you know, the, the program manager uh, and or the contracting officer. Um, um, and some of the ways to do that, uh, and I'll just tell you a, a, a quick story. Um, for me to go to a VA medical center, uh, even 15 minutes down the road for me, and to go see the head of facilities or engineering, it almost won't happen, which is interesting. But to go, for me to go to a VA conference, um, uh, their annual business, uh, uh, small business exchange, I can have lunch and dinner <laughs> with, with the facility director. So obviously, that's a, that's a great way to to uh, get to know that individual, develop that trust, and and uh, you know uh, um, more deeply. Uh, 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 give them an understanding of what you have to offer and, and develop that relationship. So th those are those are a couple thoughts and, and techniques. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so guys, I would really kind of open this up a little bit to to all of you. Is that um, let's maybe kind of walk back from your experience, maybe as a transitioning uh, member. In this is from the military. Um, we've had some guests before that have come out of um, the, you know, the support sector uh, in government, um, you know, in the public sector. What transitioning members or maybe some currently serving in the service or new uh, small business owners, what is appealing about a small business in government contracting? What why are you doing it? I guess I would say it uh, seems to be, you know, a challenging um, environment, but, uh, you know, there's, I think one that can be rewarding longer contracts in some cases or so, but why, what motivates you? What is important for that transitioning member that's looking at different opportunities um, or someone that's thinking about starting a business? Um Kind of share with me, Ben. You want to start on that? Thank you, Joni. Um, we shared before uh, everyone else joined us here. Um, I, I have maybe a more, um, uh, I have a different motivator than some other people may have for going in and staying in the defense business. So obviously, a a career in defense acquisition as a uniformed member was a great preparation for me to transition and work in the defense field. And you see many uniform members who, uh, you know, worked on tanks, jets, or whatever, go work for the company that makes the tanks and the jets, right? That's That that seems very natural. But why start your own company? And why, uh, why do you want to have the entrepreneurial piece to it? Um, I saw companies as a uniformed program manager who really cared about the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and we have to say guardian now too. So um, 
they really got it. And we need more veterans who want to help their brothers and sisters that are still wearing the uniform. And in my case, my motivation were my children. I have three kids who served in the military. Two of them are still serving. And so it is very important for me that the best technology, the best equipment we can put in their hands is delivered by people who know and understand what that means. So as a veteran, you have a mission connection to what the DOD is doing that we need more of in this industry. Excellent. Graham, thoughts? Um, yeah, I was listening to Ben. Remind me of the question. So I'm curious from your experience is what kind of counsel or encouragement or discouragement would you give a transitioning member of the services, um, a veteran, uh, someone that's maybe working for a larger company, but thinking of starting their own company? Um, why, why go into a small business enterprise? Why, why found a company in the government space? Well, first of all, I mean, small businesses are the heartbeat of the American economy. I think it's over 90% of our economy is small business. And I would argue that a veteran has learned how to be Semper Gumby, you know, how to be to to move every couple of years and pick up a new job and learn it on the spot. And those are the ingredients of a good entrepreneur. Um, I will say that uh, selling into the government doesn't have to be the only way to go. Um, we talk a lot in my field about dual use technologies, yes. which means, well, you know, what's something that you can sell to both the, the commercial market and the government. And it's a little bit of a misnomer because I think that really all we're talking about is a spectrum of small to medium to large clients. The government is just a super large client. It's very complex and Byzantine and bureaucratic but it's just a large client. So once you get a the big client on the hook, they can be great stability for your company. And um, learning the ropes of how to sell to the government is best done by people that have been in government in some capacity. So there's a whole cottage industry around it. And once you come out of uniform and you understand the lingo and everything, then it's kind of a waste to give up that corporate knowledge by completely leaving it behind. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the technologies that are available to uh, the commercial market are of interest to, to the uh, federal market. So you can be that liaison or that ambassador between the two worlds, and it's very viable. Excellent. Thank you for that. So, Bill, I'm curious in that, uh, again, the different hats that you've worn and um, certainly sitting around the trustee table at uh, our National Association, Um we, you know, the counsel you would give to um, either an, you know, an aspiring uh, entrepreneur, um, a, a veteran that is looking at different possibilities, or maybe one that just has reached a point where wondering, is this a good path? Is this, you know, how long does it take to scale a small business to success? I know that's a very generic comment, but what are some of maybe the highlights and, um, you know, kind of touch on that, if you would, please. Sure. Well, uh, in starting your own business, um, you know, there, there's a, one of the key elements uh, is um, what is your value proposition? What do you bring to the table? What product or service uh, and experience do you have to offer the customer? Um, and the other part of it is what what's your passion? What do you have a passion of doing that turns you on that you wake up every morning and, and you want to to perform uh, your your job, so that that's that can that's that that's a key essence to finding you know what, what your pathway. Um, I I would also say that, uh, um, you know, benefits of government contracting and for me, you know, I I was a contracting officer, uh, certainly working acquisition in, in the army for a number of years, and so I was also working on construction projects. So that led me to you know, doing construction, federal government contracting, that, that's one of the avenues. Um, what, what are some of the benefits? Well, um, with uh, small businesses, um, um, set asides for veterans, um, the, uh, in, 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 in my case, you know, working with the VA and, and other federal agencies, um, when I submit my invoice, I get paid net 14. 
that's unheard of um, in, in the commercial industry. When I worked for a large corporation, it was usually uh, they were pushing it back to net 90. So the yeah. cash flow is, is awesome. And, you know, when I have subcontractors, I put it in my subcontract, I'll pay you net 30, which which is, uh, you know, two weeks later. So our cash flow is uh, situation is very favorable from from that from that uh, viewpoint. Um, you know, the other the other getting back to what Ben and, and, and Graham have said, um, you know, as a, as a veteran, uh, we, we want to continue to make a difference, uh, find a way to do it. And, uh, you know, with our current uh, challenges here we're having with the U Ukraine uh, area and, and the war there and certainly many of our special forces uh, uh, mobilizing and others uh, mobilizing in Europe wanted to be able to make a difference. So um, um, as an example, um, uh, besides doing VA work, I'm also uh, modernizing the uh, Joint Operations Center of an of a, of a air base, major air base on the East Coast. So that, that's a way for me to uh, contribute, give back a little bit. Um, you know, and we are running a business, so we, we do have a, a small profit in that, but uh, very, very passionate about making sure we do all we can to have a fully functioning, modernized uh, you know, Joint Operations Center for the military. So um, we're going to turn to our questions. I'm going to give Ian a minute to um, kind of look at our chat and uh, uh, some of the questions maybe we can roll up and categorize a little bit. But while he's doing that, um, I would just like to share one aspect of NSBA that I find very beneficial is, um, as Bill mentioned, perspective. And veterans have such a marvelous perspective from experience those in defense contracting they have been or you have been the user if you will in different aspects of the government you know that again perspective can really make a difference and a good part of NSBA is our advocacy on behalf of small business and being able to kind of hear from the business owners, from the leaders themselves. And so I'd really encourage you all to take a look at some of our other programming at NSBA um, in our government affairs uh, aspects and our advocacy aspects. Um, we are nonpartisan. We um, don't engage in the political side. We just really promote the uh, the continued um, aspects of what can make small businesses successful. And uh, in the fall, we do a Washington um, a presentation, and it's a great time for you to come and share with your senators, your congressmen, your perspective. So I just really want to kind of highlight that because um, I know we all face challenges in business every day. And, um, you know, some of these pathways that we enunciated thus far really were kind of highlighted or encouraged based on, you know, some of the frameworks and the ways that the NDAA was, um, was, was written to allow some of these things. And it started with hearing voices like yours. So I would just kind of share that little point as well. So Ian, are you ready with a, a question? And then I'll point it to one of our teammates here. Yes, thank you, Joni. Uh, the first question that we have here, we're gonna throw it back to just a little earlier in the meeting, uh, but we have a question here from Tanner who asks, is there a place to get help for proposal, for proposal writing? Okay. Um, let's see, Ben, you want to maybe jump in on that? So there are, uh, as a consultant, I would say you can find consultants to do that. Uh, but you also have free resources. The Small Business Administration runs in every state, something that used to be called PTAX. Uh, help me out with a new name. They're accelerators or something like that. Oh, now. Apex. Apex, Apex accelerators. Accelerate. Thank you. So uh, those are, are uh, groups within every state who their mission, their job, and, and how they're funded and, and what they're, they're supposed to do is support small businesses, start up, and learn how to do business with the federal government. So you should look for your nearest uh, Apex Accelerator. A lot of the websites still say the PTAC and get some of the free virtual and in-person training on how to write proposals. And once you get sort of the 101 out of the way, the, the basic building blocks, then I think you would be making better use of your money if you did go after a, uh, with a consultant to help you write a specific uh, proposal for a specific agency or customer. 
So Ben, I'd just like to jump on that too, or piggyback that. Um, for example, with SBIRs, they might have some unique characteristics and that's where a consultant could really help you. Um, or kind of going back to some of the points that Graham and Bill were making on relationships, you know, find a couple buddies that, uh, you know, also that are small business owners and, um, you know, maybe do a little bit of a share. You know, if you review my red team, my proposal, I'll read to you your proposal or so and to get a perspective that way. Um, again, just kind of encouraging the networking. So, Ian, what else? Let's see here. We have a question from NSBA member Wes Guckert. Wes asks, he says that he's interested in unsolicited proposals. Mm -hmm. Anything special to know? Graham. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with these, but um, basically if my understanding is uh, an unsolicited proposal is required to be uh, reviewed by the federal government if you submit it. So that there's that benefit when I was running business development for Alaska Native Corporation and also worked for Cherokee Federal, um, they had had some success with unsolicited proposals. But really what you have to do is do some shaping where you, you know, you get after the industry events uh, and you develop relationships. And then you write basically a white paper that has a ham sandwich. It lays out the whole problem, solution and procurement recommendation. And you get it to the right person. And that's really kind of the best approach, I think, for unsolicited. If you have a great product and you just write an unsolicited proposal, start, you know, shooting it off in, into the, the void, you're probably not going to get anything out of that. But but it is good to have a nice, well-written proposal ready to share with anybody, just like a business card or a capability statement. If I could tag on to that real quick, Joni. Yes, um, unsolicited proposals are very interesting because they're handled very differently from agency to agency, department to department, and even within the DOD, even inside the same service, you'll find the buying commands will be very different about how they handle that. So uh, sometimes if you go to their websites and you go to their how to do business with us page, it will tell you if they accept unsolicited proposals or if they do, how should you do that? Um, I would also echo Graham's comment. I would be specific and say, uh, nearly, uh, well, every department and agency does have a small business advocate or a small business office. Many of the larger buying commands within those agencies or buying agencies or buying commands or buying uh, units uh, for other agencies besides DOD, um, they have uh, designated individuals who can help you uh, with that process and connect you. And what you want to do there is you want to tie your unsolicited proposal to one of their s &T needs or one of their um, help, uh, industry need help from industry pages. They usually they usually keep these. They'll have a, you know what we're looking for for s &T or where we need help from industry. You want to make sure that you connect your uh, what you're trying to to get them to pay attention to to one of the things that they said that they need. So in other words, they're advertising a problem. You want to come in with a solution to that problem. Absolutely, good advice. Um, I also find with unsolicited proposals that you first find the user, find the person, the point of pain or who needs this and have a discussion first, kind of lay the environment out before you submit. So there's, you've got a, somebody with a catcher's mitt on the other side, as opposed to just doing this all digitally with no kind of um, preliminary, you know, touch points. So I think that uh, increases your chances that. Uh, yeah, I, would, I, would, I would mention uh, uh, just a real quick, um, okay. you know, um, unsolicited proposals, typically they take a lot uh, longer lead time versus a, a solicitation that's already posted, already funded. Um, so you really have to balance that. And the other thing I would say is that uh, um, do all you can to quickly um understand if there's a true need or if there's an appetite for the, that department or agency that's going to want your uh, pr uh, proposal. So as an example, I, I formed a team uh, uh, earlier earlier in the history of the, of, the, of the company, and we went to the Pentagon offering it to them. And uh, we thought we had a great product. Um, 
and uh, we went to the uh, deputy uh, assistant secretary of, uh, of the army at the time. And uh, he said, well, it's a great idea, but we don't want it. So <laughs> it told us very quickly, you know, to move on to other things. No, that's that's good advice. The other thing I would share, too, is if the agency or entity is uh, experiencing budget cuts and, you you know, that's a time which they are, have to really prioritize. So, again, that alignment um, not just on, on what their needs are for the service or, you know, the, the, the product, but also maybe lead with efficiencies or cost saving, something that meets that kind of um, aspect that could potentially catch their attention, uh, you know, in times when resources are tight. So, Ian, do you have another question for us? I do. And I think, this question, while not directly related to veteran-owned businesses, uh, fits well with, with the last question that, that we took. Uh, we have Matt S. here, who owns a small business that provides a niche service of natural stone restoration. Uh, they do work on museums, embassies, condos, residences, etc. cetera. Um, uh, let's see here. Matt says that there are not many federal RFPs for their services, Generally, it seems like the government wants to rebuild rather than restore. Do mm -hmm. you all have any recommendations on educating the federal workplace or the federal marketplace who likely doesn't know much about their niche services? Because going around one at a time seems like an incredibly inefficient endeavor. Okay, who would like to grab that question? I'm happy to jump on it. I mean, the one that Mike Griffin also asked is relevant. So, I mean, the secret to this type of thing for small businesses is teaming, teaming, teaming. So there might be a larger contract that uh, you don't have your eye on, but a large construction company that does, you know, rehab for government or, or you know, restoration for government might need a subcontractor that has your service for stone. And, and that's how you overcome the uh, past performance issue too. If you do a joint venture with another company that has a contract footholds and customer intimacy, but you bring in some sort of niche capability, that's how you're gonna get uh, some past performance built up. Absolutely, that's a good answer. Thank you, Graham. Um, and I, if, if I may, because we kind of dovetailed into that next question from Mike Griffin, mm -hmm. Mike asks, uh, as a, how does a new veteran-owned small business overcome past performance requirements and RFPs? So that's where we get into that question. And if if our panel would like to uh, address either or of those last two questions or take them together, whatever you'd like to do, please. So Bill, you want to start that one? Sure. So um, starting your company, you um, have have uh, finished your military experience, finished some corporate experience, what have you, you have experience. And the government will accept uh, that that uh, that experience. So when I started my company with uh, construction, I uh, had just left uh, Pfizer um, and managing construction projects. So I used that as my uh, demonstrated performance. And I had my references, of course, with the with the with uh, my, uh, my managers and, and uh, other individuals uh, within that corporation. So that's perfectly acceptable. Um, if you think about it, you know, the government, they they, they want uh, uh, their products or services provided, you know, that you can't expect, it, you can't be the chicken and the egg that you can't get it until you have, you know, government contracts. There's got to be some flexibility in there, in there and there absolutely is with, with past performance from other other ways uh, besides government contracting. I'd also I'd say in this environment that um, there is quite a push across the government, especially in the uh, the IC and the DOD, to really reach out with the dual use um, or or um, services products in the private sector. And so, just really, as Bill said, capsulizing your private sector experience. Honestly, that's why folks initially years ago came and found me was my private sector experience. So they needed to look at some things differently. And um, so my past performance in the private sector, I was able to enunciate in, in the right ways to, to be used as initial past performance. So, and Ben, I think you were gonna add something in there. Well, I, I wanted to go back to Mike's, really his direct question. There are some RFPs 
that you know it's the LLC, the company, that entity has to have the past performance. In that case, unfortunately, uh, uh, Bill and Joni, your personal yeah, experience wouldn't matter. help. Yeah, and so one, you have to be very careful about that. Two, um, you, uh, Joni already kind of alluded to it. You can go and get commercial experience to help build that if that's an easier bridge to get into or start smaller, right? And then back to what Graham said, it's about the teaming to, 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 you know, get on with somebody that, you know, and then it goes back to relationships, right? Uh, when, uh, when I was in acquisition, a lot of people would say, it's all about people and money, people and money. And, and my mantra was, no, it's all about people. Cause I don't know a dollar that can spend itself. Good point. Good point. Ian, I think we can do one more and then I'm going to give everyone a chance to wrap up a quick one, quick question. Fantastic. This is a quick one. Uh, it might be divisive. So We'll look forward to your insights here. Uh, Salim asks, how helpful is SAM.gov when it comes to federal contracts? Who would like to start on that one? <laughs> well, we we, uh, we use it all the time. I mean, uh, SAM.gov is broken into a couple of different categories. Uh, I mean, uh, basically, you know, it's where the, uh, anything over $25,000 for a solicitation has to be posted on, on SAM.gov. So, um, uh, know that number one, number two, um, on SAM.gov, you're going to have, you know, the wage determination. So when you're developing your, your proposal, um, estimated number of hours it takes to do whatever certain type of job and times the, the uh, Davis Bacon wage rate, if that's the wage rate that you're have, it's under in the contract, you know, for developing your proposals and, and the cost for it. Um, so the, it's, uh, and then also you have the, what is it? The, uh, uh federal procurement data, um, FPDS. Uh, that provides a uh, past performance. So again, anything over 25,000 um, uh, bucks or contract awards goes on to a historical database. And from that historical database, you can find out um, you know, when a, uh, a, a multi-year contract is coming due, a MATOC as an example, or a basic ordering agreement. Um, and so that you can do your timing for when, when you wanna be prepared to uh, uh, propose on that uh, multi-year uh, contract. So those are just a couple of, of examples. Excellent. If I could uh, jump on there too. So um, the, the data is the source data for any other tool. Okay, so it is the authorita authoritative source of data. It is not as user-friendly as some of the other more expensive tools are. So for you, you're, it's gonna have to be, a, how quickly can you get trained up? How can you be an expert at SAM.gov if you don't have that amount of time and you'd rather just pay the money, maybe go look for a tool that has already sucked in the data and is a little bit more searchable, a little easier. Bill, I also wanna uh, uh, expound on something you said about the $25,000. So what you won't find on there for even things that are you know millions of dollars would be on other uh, contracts that are pre previously awarded where there are you, people won uh, to get on the IDIQ or the BIC or the whatever it is. So. Uh, for instance, there's something that Navy has is called Seaport. You won't see uh, solicitations coming out on Seaport, even if they're $10 million, if you're not a Seaport contract holder. But what you will see is you'll see once they award that contract, those expenditures, when you go into FPDS, so you're going to look in the rear view mirror on those contracts, vice looking out the windshield. So, so that's why being on some of these um, uh, IDIQs or best in class vehicles like NASA soup, like, like, you know, uh, somewhat GSA and others, um, RS, army RS three there, there, there's lots of them. You need to compete to get on Oasis Alliant. You hear all the words, um, you need to get on that vehicle to be able to see that opportunity coming out. Cause it will sometimes be on sam.gov, uh, but a lot of times it won't be. Mm -hmm. You know, what, you know what are the, one of the interesting, I'm sorry, just real quick, uh, interesting things about uh, what what Ben mentioned is that there's uh, some uh, other um, uh, databases that, of course, of course, they want you to uh, invest in it, uh, but uh, there also are some that will give you a little tickler of, of them, you know, before they, uh, uh, to try to reel, reel you in, if you will. But, uh, you know, you can, you can Google the energy um, on a government tribe, and you can, uh, you know, I guess you have like three looks, but you can look. And one of the things that, that I found of interest is that uh, um, it'll have every uh, federal government contract award that in Eonergy's history from when we started in 2012 to, to current. So um, 
they, they, for, for me to go do all of that computation would probably take many, uh, uh, several days, but uh, there it is, you know, straightforward in, in a graph format from just a, you know, free sample of, uh, of that, uh, of that, uh, another database. Graham, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I totally agree. SAM.gov is a lot of the data. Uh, obviously, you don't see the stuff that's on the pre-competed contracts, but you can also look over the ARC to look at the intelligence community contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, for the third party uh, overlays that give you a better user interface, of course, everyone uses GovWin and Bloomberg Gov and things like that. Uh, what you'll want to look at as a differentiator between those different platforms is whether or not they do some crowdsourcing on top of the data scrape. Because if they're just pulling the same data that SAM.gov has in your small business, you can get it from SAM.gov. But if you're gonna pay for some additional analysis on top of that, which might cost you hundreds or thousands of dollars a month, then you have to ask yourself, how good is that analysis? And I won't name any names, but you know, the ones that are doing that kind of analysis, sometimes it's just done by college kids that are picking up the phone and dialing the program offices. So you can do that too. Um, it's just, uh, it is not a great interface for ICM.gov. Okay, I think that gives us a good perspective there. I also use it to see who's interested in the various BAAs or proposals or who's, you know, that, that has signed up, if you will, for more information. So sometimes that's good insight of potential teaming partners if I want to mm -hmm. get on a team. So I find that to be a useful um, resource. It's just not the most, we were kind of had a little giggle in the beginning because it is not an easy interface. It's not as user-friendly like has been mentioned, but it is the source of data and it is what you really can get out of it um, and uh, spend some time on it. And again, that's another one, just through your relationships, find some somebody that's really expert on it and ask them for a few tips because I found, you know, early on, somebody that could show me a couple, you know, tips and tricks really got me closer to the answer I needed to find and, um, you know, kind of accelerated my learning curve. So folks, if I want to- Joni, if, if we may, while you're on that, on that item, uh, if you'd like to share just a little bit about the Veterans Network Mentorship Program. Okay. Um, just as a quick plug. Shameless well, plug. Um, I think what we'll do here is um, really, uh, Ian, I'm going to jump that back to you. But before we do that, can I just give, I want to give um, Bram, Bill, and Ben just uh, one minute is I want your kind of goose that laid the golden egg um, encouragement or, you know, one or two things that uh, you would share that you think is important for folks to know today in this environment you know, in government contracting. Graham, you want to start? Sure. If you're here and you're an entrepreneur and you're running a business, I am so impressed. And uh, the fact that you're networking with other entrepreneurs, the fact that you're interested in working with the federal government, which means you are a public servant. There is no us and them. There is no such thing as a public servant and a non-public servant, because if you're a taxpayer, you're in America, we're all in this together. So I just appreciate everybody here. And I'm a, a resource for if you want to reach out. Thank you, Graham. Bill? Yeah, I'm, one of the things that's helped me, um, this might sound, sound a little bit simplistic, but uh, whether it's, uh, you know, getting into uh, West Point or going to Ranger School or finishing a 20-year Army career, uh, or in this case, starting my own business, is uh, the notion that uh, if other people can do it, I can do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you start a business, there's so many unknowns, there's so many uh, uncertainties, but you just got to know that other people can do it and you can do it. And it's a matter, it is a matter of reaching out for, for uh, assistance, um, asking for, you know, finding, you know, the best practices or finding others that, that can help you. And I'll, I'll just, I'll just put in one, one other plug for, um, you know, somebody asked about proposal, but uh, the uh, service Corps of retired executives or score is an incredible organization. And when you think about it for us, we wanted a uh, advisory board to help with the company. You know, if you're you're uh, if you're your CEO, a uh, uh, president of your company, it can be lonely at the top. Where's your accountability? Um, so that's why a, a, a board of advisors can be really critical. And SCORE set that up for us. Uh, we wanted help with uh, construction. We wanted help with the uh, financials. We wanted help with uh, government contracting. And they set up a board of advisors for us at no cost. 
and we could meet with them at the frequency we, we agree, mutually agreed to, and they were invaluable, keeping us on track, having somebody to go to at, to ask questions, and uh, and and uh, so I, I offer that as a as another uh, another opportunity. Okay, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I think you you cannot uh, engage your network soon enough if you plan. If you're in and you're you're getting out and you want to set up a business, or if you're already out, you're working in industry and you want to create your own business, um, it's about your network and it's about planning and planning takes time. So start as soon as you have that notion, get through those hard questions you have in your mind. How am I going to make a living until I get this done? Well, guess what? After the military, there's a lot of and and not ors. So you can do this and that. Uh, so So bridge it, right? Even if you're in the military, if you can start part-time your business, you're starting that past performance. You're starting the learning curve. Um, so, so it's about starting soon, starting with as, as large a network as you can, and mentorships, which is a specific kind of networking. Talk to advisors who can help you so you don't stub your toe on the same rock that everyone else has stubbed their toe on before. Okay. And so Ian mentioned our Veterans Network. And this year, we launched the network within the NSBA and really what it is, is it's kind of a mentorship matching platform. So if you'd like some counsel, a little guidance, you just would like a, um, a comrade to, to discuss an issue with that you're facing in your business, it's a opportunity to basically connect a seasoned veteran business owner with someone who has a question. So it is really the peer to peer kind of mentorship or um, you know, kind of free advisory. And um, if you are a, as, as well as a veteran that you think you have some time that you could potentially share, you know, we'd certainly love you on that side to be a mentor. Or if you are um, thinking about or a transitioning service member, and uh, thinking about starting a business or at a different having challenges as you look at your scaling of your business, businesses have different stages. Um, please, our, it's on our website uh, where you signed up to, to join this podcast, you will see. And uh, we really, really encourage that. It's a great network. We've had wonderful feedback thus far. And I'd just like to close today, first of all, thanking all of our uh, gentlemen here today. I think the different perspectives, the different pathways, and um, I'd like to end on, on this note. Um, I was raised, I'm the daughter of a small businessman, so I think it's a DNA. I have a daughter that's working for a small business and has entrepreneurial ideas as well, and uh, my son is, is an entrepreneur as well. I'm blessed with, I get to work with the absolute best people, the most innovative, courageous, amazing folks, uh, the men and women of the armed services. And um, I am uh, absolutely feel blessed and I get to do that because I own a small business. So on that note, I'd just like to say, I wish everyone a safe and wonderful thanks, upcoming Thanksgiving. I thank Graham, Ben, and Bill, and then Patrick and Ian for putting all this together. And um, I think we're ready to wrap up. Any last words, Ian? No, you hit the nail yeah. on the head, Joni. Okay. And again, we would just like to thank uh, everyone for being here today. And if you haven't yet, please check out our free Veterans Network. Uh, within that, we've got our free mentorship program and a whole host of other resources. Thank you all. Great. Take care. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much.